I'm so delighted uh, to be able to continue our conversation this morning. I was going to say with uh, speaker, former and perhaps future uh, Speaker of the House, Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi. Uh, we were just uh, talking backstage uh, about how much things actually have changed, and we should take a moment, even as we're uh, thinking about the, the challenges that everybody's been talking about this morning, uh, when Nancy Pelosi was first elected to the House in 1987, there were 23 uh, women members of uh, the House and two women senators. So things certainly have changed in many ways. Now a majority of the House Democratic Caucus will be other than white men this year. Is that right? It is. Well, thank you, Susan, for the invitation to be here. I was with many of you last year with my daughter, Alexandra. She sends her regards. Her six-year-old's turning seven this week, so she's busy at home and in New York and with her work, but sends her regards. Yes, just to put that 23 in perspective, say you went to an event even bigger than this, 435 people there, 43 tables, two of them of women, 41 of them full of men. It was a very small number. We made a decision on our side of the aisle that we had to increase that number and we're up to 64 now, not satisfied by any means, but have uh, now at 64, it was 12 Democrats, 11 Republicans, now at 64 Democrats, 19 Republicans. We're all, we've moved, but we all both have to move much more. But as Susan indicated, our House Democratic Caucus is a majority of women, minorities, and LGBT community members. That's a pretty remarkable thing uh, for any political party in any parliament in the world. Well, that's right. When you think about where we started uh, when you came in 1987. So we have had so many women members uh, here participating in this event in different ways today. I gave them a little bit of a quiz before they came. I asked them a few questions. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you, one of the questions I asked was, uh, what, by what year, if ever, do you think there uh, will be gender parity in the US Congress? Uh, and now I'll tell you what they said, but I, first I'm curious what you say. Well, first let me say that I'm not satisfied with gender parity. <laughs> majority, cer majority. <laughs> <laughs> and we certainly want that, but we have a couple hundred years of, of uh, past uh, deficits uh, to make up for. But uh, certainly not at the rate we are going will we even be there uh, in the lifetime of many of the young women in this room. Uh, it's a decision. It was a decision we made to go from uh, 12 to now in the mid-60s. Uh, we want more. But it's a decision that has to be made by women that they will run. Because that's the hard thing. It's, and that's why I keep saying to women, know your power. You have it within you to undertake any of these tasks. It is nothing, there is nothing more wholesome uh, to government, to politics, the civic life of our country, to anything, uh, any endeavor, than the fuller participation of women, especially women in the leadership of those uh, uh, institutions. So I would say it would be possible to do so uh, by 2050 if we decide that that is what we want to do. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I have to tell you, you are the most optimistic uh, of anyone. Everyone else basically said, not in my lifetime. Uh, no. That's <laughs> uh, not So acceptable. that's a very, well, and you know, it's interesting too, because I've never seen a concrete goal set forward. Mm -hmm. So uh, that seems like a whole nother career's worth of work for you. Uh, well, let me just say, uh, for example, in the 90s, I was tasked with three other people, Senator Harkin, Senator Specter, Senator uh, Congressman Porter, Democratic, Republican, bipartisan, we were tasked to double the NIH budget in five years. It was a big, tall order. We worked very hard, not alone, but mobilizing outside groups, college, universities, private sector, the public sector, nonprofit, and all the rest, and we achieved it. We need to do something like that again. And so when I'm talking to these same groups, they keep saying, give us a goal. Give us a timetable. And that's what you have to do. You, you don't achieve it by just hoping for it, reaching out for it. Set a timetable, decide what the goal is, establish your milestones, 
work toward those. You know this from those of you in the private sector, that that's what you have to do. Same thing here. A goal, a timetable, milestones to measure, the have the metrics. And if that decision is made, and everything that goes with it, the training, the opportunity in terms of other elected offices or appointed offices along the way. It's a, it's a, a very achievable goal, uh, and, but it, and it is one that will be a, really a remarkable thing for our country. We're requiring it in some of the countries that we deal with, that they have X percentage of women in their parliaments, and yet we don't, we don't require that. We wouldn't be able to require it, I don't think, but we can make it happen. I'm so optimistic about that. Well, it's always good to have an optimist, uh, at least before lunch, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, now, tell me, one of the other questions, though, I asked, and I was really struck by the answers. Uh, I asked the other women members, uh, what is the most sexist thing that you have experienced in your career in politics? Sexy, uh, and, and I thought that many of them might say, well, you know, I'd move beyond that or no. And every single one, you know, had something interesting <laughs> and really, you know, almost infuriating to recount. Uh, I think it was Marshall Blackburn simply wrote, the list is too long to write. Mm. After the elections, you had a very interesting press conference uh, in which you were asked about the election results in the midterms and, and Democrats and how they performed. And I thought you, you had a very interesting answer uh, when people asked whether you would consider stepping down as leader now, uh, raised your age. And you said, you know, this is an example of, uh, in effect, gender bias. How come I wasn't on the cover of Time magazine? Well, here's the thing. When I was elected Speaker of the House, this is a constitutional office, the third highest office in the land, President, Vice President, Speaker of the House. Now, most people, everybody knows who the President is. Some people are aware who the Vice President is. <laughs> Not that many people know about the Speaker of the House. The Speaker of the House has awesome power. This was a very big deal for a woman I never thought a woman would be speaker before a woman would be president because I thought the American people were way ahead of the Congress in terms of uh, uh, electing a woman. But I conceived a plan to take back the House, raise the money, recruited the team to do the job, the leadership to make it happen, and we broke a, a chain of defeats of year in and year out and year in and year out where they never asked the leader if he would step down because we weren't winning. And he's a wonderful leader. I, I wouldn't have asked him either. But they never asked the leader, 2004, 2006, 2008, 2010, 2002. So when it was my turn, we won. And uh, so we brought the victory that we had, that we lost, didn't mean the person who brought the victory should leave. It means we have to fight right back. We have to fight right back. That's the way I saw it. Whereas they were not asking any of the men on the other side who kept losing and losing and losing and losing, did you ever th think of stepping aside, who were similar in gender. But you know what, I don't get too bogged down on that. The Time Magazine thing got me in this respect. I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, my, who I am is family. So I don't care about being on Time Magazine except that it was recognition of a woman. And then it made me think, what other women are they ignoring with their covers who should be recognized? Why wouldn't you recognize a woman, first woman's history, Speaker of the House? And it didn't really phase me too much. I mean, I didn't think about it so much at the time until they elected a male speaker right there on the front of Time magazine, the leader of the Senate, not even a constitutional office, not even as high as speaker, right on the front of Time magazine. You'd have to ask them. But I do think it's not right that women should be, shall we say, uh, second class in terms of the recognition that they should receive. Having nothing to do with me. If it only had to do with me, I wouldn't even bring it up. But having to do with all of the accomplishments uh, that women have made and are making. Now, maybe Time Magazine isn't what it used to be when I was young, and I'm giving it more value than it should have. But nonetheless, I do think it's really important. Takes me back to what I think many of you may experience or have experienced just a few short years ago in your young lives. I was um, 
volunteer in our library system in San Francisco. I had these five little children volunteer in the libraries. One day they said to me, we want you to be a library commissioner. And I said, oh, no, no, that's OK. I love the library. I would do the same work without being a commissioner. Give it to somebody else. Then the, mayor, the then mayor, Mayor Alioto, said to me, that is so wrong, especially as a woman. You should have official recognition for what you were doing. Why should you be doing this work and not get the recognition. You love the library, you have a commitment. And I'll tell you this, I accepted the commission chip. I had a vote on the commission. We took our meetings out to the neighborhood. We made, you have a vote, people want to know what you think. You have official status. So don't uh, be modest about accepting recognition for what you do, because you never know what could come next, whether it's being library commissioner on the front of a magazine. So what about President of the United States? I'm struck in listening to you talk about the Time Magazine issue that these are potentially many of the same issues that would greet Hillary Clinton, uh, the convergence of our attitudes around age and our attitudes around uh, gender. And Hillary Clinton, uh, see, I mean, first of all, I think they should give women time for raising family and, or being first wife of Arkansas, first lady of the United States, whatever. Because this is a, a, an investment of time, an important investment of time. So by the time she does all of that and then runs for Senate on her own, becomes Secretary of State, she has amassed uh, a set of credentials and leadership achievement that would make her one of the most well-prepared people to enter the Oval Office in the past few decades. Uh, does it mean other people aren't good and they have others? I'm talking about credentials and accomplishments of global and national stature. So when she runs, she'll win. And when she wins, she'll be the, one of the best prepared people to enter there, whatever her age. It has, an, it, it has given her time to accomplish much. And uh, I think it's really a very exciting. And I will be relieved which also sort of like, I would like to be relieved of the title, the highest ranking woman in politics in America. I want to have a woman president of the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, this is probably not the toughest audience that you'll face on that, on that issue. Uh, let, me, let me ask you to put your, your leader, your highest ranking woman hat on for a second here. And let's, let's talk about what's going on in Congress since, uh, since the fallout of the midterm elections. Today, we're expecting to see a bill. You've been negotiating uh, hard behind the scenes on this. Uh, where do you think you ended up? Uh, have we definitively averted the possibility of a government shutdown at this point? And what, what have been the most contentious issues with Republicans on this? Well, I'm not going to answer all of those questions because until the bill is out there, we, we really, and when I say that, people say, well, until we see it, we don't see it. But until it is out there, until it is complete, then we'll see when many things are agreed to, then other things are agreed to. But here's the thing. We must avoid a shutdown of government. That is such a dereliction of duty. Do your job. Get it done. Figure it out. Make it work. And that's what we have to do. That's not what happened one year ago. We supplied 200 votes to the speaker and said, all you need are 20 votes to keep government open. We don't like what you're proposing, but we like less shutting down government. They shut it down anyway, 17 days that they didn't have to. When they finally opened it up, the large amount of votes that opened up government were still Democratic votes, and a large number of Republican votes didn't open it up to keep it shut down. Now, that's not to be partisan. It's just to say there's a difference of opinion of how serious it is to shut down government. We're going to be responsible. We're going to try to cooperate all that we can. I think we're on a good path. I'm not at liberty to say what some of the particulars are. But uh, if uh, Democratic votes are required to pass the bill, then the bill has to have a certain level of, of uh, uh, bipartisanship for that to happen. I'm very hopeful that uh, that will be the case and that we'll all see the bill very soon and that it will be uh, a matter of days before we'll be on to enjoying another beautiful holiday. 
My understanding was that in some of the negotiations, there was a real back and forth in particular over um, uh, the issue of contraceptive funding and uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and this goes right both, I, I'm curious, you know, what you can tell us about that negotiation. And then also, what does it tell us about uh, whether you believe there really is a women's policy agenda as opposed to the more bipartisan view of, you know, I think you'll get Republican women and Democratic women saying, yes, we'd like to have more bigger numbers uh, in Congress, but then there's a real divide over the question of whether uh, there is a, an actual women's agenda that transcends the parties. Well, first let me say this. If, if what you want to know is how Congress works, and what's going on with the bill in terms of the specific negotiations. How it works is the appropriators are in radio silence negotiating the appropriations part of the bill. So if I had all that knowledge, I would not be able to share it with you. Now come the additionals, whether it's TRIA, uh, uh, terrorism risk insurance, whether it's issues that relate to pensions and labor unions, whether it's issues that relate to expats and how they are treated under the Affordable Care, all those kinds of issues, not necessarily appropriations issues, but issues that will take a ride on this engine should it happen to leave the station called uh, the, the omnibus bill. This one's called the Cromnibus bill. So it's like a, a donut and a croissant in New York, a <laughs> cronut, but that's a whole other that's a whole other issue, that they want it to be a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and a CR, a, a, well, more than you, than you might need to know on the subject. So I really can't, I'm not at liberty to share much of what is there. I'm not being coy about it. It's just in order to have agreement, everybody has to stick together is the view until it makes its debut, and then we either for it or, or not for it. What, one of the reasons I'm still in Congress is to protect the Affordable Care Act, which I think is one of the most transformational thing of our, you're younger, but of a, of a generation of people in Congress. It stands right up there with Social Security, with Medicare and Medicaid, affordable care, uh, health access to affordable quality health care for all Americans. No longer will being a woman be a pre-existing medical condition. This is a big deal in terms of ending that discrimination, which, which no more pre-existing conditions as a, 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 a deterrent to getting a, a, a policy, uh, no lifetime caps, really important. Honoring our founders' life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, a healthier life, the freedom to pursue your happiness without being policy locked to a job. Instead, having the freedom to change jobs, start a business, be entrepreneurial, and uh, be self-employed. So that, to me, is a, not only a bill and a law, but a transformation in our society. So any time one of these engines comes down the track, it's real, and we protected women's reproductive health in the Affordable Care Act. Any time one of these engines comes down the track, I have to make sure it does not do violence to the Affordable Care Act. If there's some improvements that we all want to make, that's positive, but not to unravel it. And so that was an important part of uh, viewing some parts of this bill. And uh, there are others, like Wall Street Reform, Dodd-Frank, uh, to, uh, to preserve the consumer protections and taxpayer protections in that. But just sticking with the, uh, the health care uh, healthcare bill. Whether there's a woman's agenda, they certainly should be. But I do think that what I saw in the last election, because we had our agenda, when women succeed, America succeeds. It was about three things. Equal pay for equal work and raising minimum wage was about pay. It was about um, paid sick leave, so that no mom would have to choose, or dad, between caring for a child, a sick child at home, bless you, or a sick parent, or, what, or sick spouse. And, and uh, or losing a day's work. And the third, so pay, about pay, about paid leave, and about what I think is something that we really must all stick together to do, affordable quality childcare. It is the missing link, in my view, in the evolution of women.
in evolution of women in the workplace. Evolution of women in the workplace and in our society. We had our suffragettes, how brave they were, all that they did. Leave home, I mean, leave home, that was a big deal then. Go out there and fight. When the women finally, um, uh, the vote was cast and uh, the women got the right to vote, the headline said, women given the right to vote. Not so, women fought, women marched, women starved, women were starved. Okay, so now we have the right to vote. A couple decades, it took decades, as you know. Then a couple decades later, Rosie the Riveter, women in the workplace, helping in the war effort. This was in something new, women leaving home to work. Many of them getting equal pay at that time because some of them belonged to unions and that institution has helped in the equal pay of women along the way. But then higher education of women, women in the professions, women starting businesses, women entrepreneurs, all of that so great, but no affordable quality child care for women or for men. And I do believe that once we put that in place, quality, affordable child care, that we will unleash the power of women in such a substantial way uh, that children learning, parents earning, and having the freedom. You, you know, it's, I have four daughters, professionals, with children, I'm in awe of all of you who do that. I was sequential, raised my children, ran for Congress. But uh, to see you all balance all of that is so remarkable. You can do anything. I hope you know that. But that's what I think, uh, uh, I don't see anything partisan about child care. In fact, it was on President Nixon's desk in the 70s. The child care bill was almost there. But there were certain forces in our country, for one reason or another, who decided they didn't like the sociology that they imagined associated with women having that opportunity. And so he vetoed the bill. 40 years, some years later, it's very long overdue and something I think that we can work in a nonpartisan way uh, to, uh, to put forward. But again, it's a decision. We need a goal. We need a timetable. We need milestones, and we want that to be a short, uh, short timetable. And if we go to that place, again, it will, uh, again, I use the word unleash the power of women in a very substantial way. So I would hope that we could find common ground with the women on both sides of the aisle on, on this subject, and with men too, and with men too, because child care is a, a family issue as well as uh, a women's issue. But the, in this past campaign, what I saw, that was our what we put forth. But what, when you're talking about jobs, and equal pay, and you're talking about paid leave and childcare so when you can work while your children learn, you have to have a job. And the problem was that people just didn't see as much job opportunity of the kinds of jobs they wanted to have. And that was not a woman's issue. That was men and women across the board. So what we have to do is have more good paying jobs. And if women are going to get equal pay for equal work, they have to have equal education. I know that Congresswoman Eshoo brought some of this up. And if we're ever going to have equality in education, we must go down the path of technology. We cannot incrementally try to improve, not just for women, but for all people in every strata of our economic life in our country. We're not going to make it up. The differences are getting too great. We have to use technology to leapfrog over those economic disparities so we can have economic equality and many more people can be getting equal pay uh, for equal work, women and men alike. Peter Pelosi, definitely you put your optimist hat on this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you.